Hello everyone, this is Tom Fox and I'd like to welcome you to episode 75 of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report. Today it is my distinct pleasure to have back one of my favorite guests, Roy Snell, the CEO of the Society of Corporate Compliance and Ethics, or SCCE. Roy is going to visit with us today about the upcoming national conference, which will be held in Chicago in September of this year. He talks about some of the highlights of the speakers, the advanced discussion group, the networking, and the vendors. I hope that you will enjoy this episode and enjoy hearing Roy as much as I use, do and, as well. Uh, I'm Thank very you very much for listening. I'm very pleased to have listening. you back on our, um, this episode uh, because uh, we have the upcoming national uh, conference, the SEECE conference. So I asked Roy if he could come on and visit with us a little bit about uh, this year's event, and he's uh, taken some time from his very busy uh, schedule to do so. So, Roy, uh, once again, thank you and welcome. Well, I'm glad to be here, Tom. Uh, this year, Roy, we are uh, conferencing a little bit earlier than I think we have over the past couple of years. We're in uh, September, and we're in Chicago. Uh, could you give us uh, some of the highlights of uh, the conference from where you sit? Well, um we have a, a very interesting group of uh, of uh, keynote speakers this year. Uh, every year we try very hard to get uh, a lot of diversity. We try and get a little bit of perspective from the enforcement community, and we've got that and the uh, assistant director of the FBI who is going to be talking about cybercrime um, and uh, given the recent issues at Target and the fact that the compliance profession is getting more and more involved in uh, IT compliance. This would be very relevant. Uh, we also have uh, Marianne Jennings, who's one of the most respected ethicists in the country, is uh, going to speak. Uh, I'm going to speak for the first time. Uh, uh, I've never done a general session before. This year, I'm going to do a general session with Jenny O'Brien uh, from United Healthcare about uh, influence and the role of influence um, of the compliance officer. Um, it's very, uh, it's a very important area. A lot of us get uh, into the technical aspects of the job quite a bit, and uh, there's a real need to focus on some of the soft skills or the personal skills uh, that one needs to try and get the organization to move in the right direction. Uh, some of us feel that we're, we have less of a problem finding problems in this country uh, than we do resolving them. Enron, WorldCom, Tyco, HealthSouth, Penn State University, the problems were known by some very bright people, and in some cases for a very long time, but nobody in the room was able to to create the influence needed to uh, solve the 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 issue properly. And uh, so we'll be talking about that. And uh, uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, networking opportunities uh, uh, going on too. Uh, we're really looking forward to another uh, great conference. Uh, Roy, you, you said a, a lot of different things in there, so maybe I could uh, break down some of those and we could go into some detail. Uh, the Obviously, one of the things that uh, caught my eye when I got my brochure was uh, uh, the FBI agent who's going to speak to us about cybersecurity. And one of the sort of challenges I've been struggling with from a compliance perspective is how does the, the world of cybersecurity and anti-corruption, anti-bribery compliance, or other compliance overlap. Uh, how, how do you see that? Well, um, I used to be in IT. It was a very short period of time. It was only a minor of mine in college. It's it's not like I'm tremendously qualified to represent the IT world, but m my experience is, is they tend to see things all um, electronically. And uh, their 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 compliance generally focuses on um, electronic uh, controls. And what the compliance professional is being asked to do now 
is to get involved in this uh, IT compliance from a little broader perspective um, and trying to help the IT folks um, expand the scope of their involvement in compliance. A, a real great, a simple example would be is, uh, you know, auditing on a regular basis whether people are leaving their terminals on or whether they're leaving their passwords uh, posted on their screen or under their keyboard, um, auditing to see if the passwords are being changed on a regular basis. Um, and then in the case of um, Target, it appears as though they had given a vendor access to part of their system and that they didn't make the connection that that part of the system that that vendor could get into could be um, could be a little dangerous and they could they could get into areas of the system from their password that the organization really didn't want them to get into and and the, that there may be some auditing done on a regular basis of all the people who have access to the system that there are that the expected limits of their access are actually being met um and then the the other piece of it is if it was done by a thing called key logging um that's another thing that you could audit all of the people who have access to the system even if it's supposed to be l limited administrative access that the people who have access have adequate antivirus software running on their system to prevent key logging which is essentially a a tool hackers use to uh, steal the password and sign on as people are signing on. Uh, so um, IT compliance really needs to be broadened. And uh, we as a professional association are going to spend some time over the next couple of years increasing our education, uh, finding the experts in the field to try and help the compliance professional work with uh, the IT folks not to take over and replace what they're doing, but to to help, to supplement, to ask the questions, and frankly, pr probably uh, make sure that things that are expected to uh, be happening are happening by doing audits and monitoring and that controls are put in place. It's what compliance does is use the seven elements of a compliance program on risk areas that in the past didn't use all the elements of a compliance program. And that's that's where we can help out, the compliance profession can help out, and uh, we're very fortunate to have a very high-ranking individual from the FBI who's going to come in and talk about this subject. You know, Roy, I have to share with you that is the best explanation of why compliance needs to be involved in IT security I've ever heard. Even I now understand the reason. So thank you for that. Yeah, well, you know what's funny is uh, I, I, as I talk to you in previous conversations, sometimes my job is to help people see things in more sim simple terms. I think we've got a lot of people that are trying to make uh, compliance a, con a complex concept and that it really isn't that complex. It's really f f quite simple. The, the problem is, is that the simple concepts or the seven elements of a compliance program just aren't being executed and uh you know we're we as an organization are trying to help people understand that this isn't really rocket science it's a bunch of diligent work and uh i really appreciate the fact that you noticed the, that we really do try to uh, make this easier and 
and and simpler and frankly by sharing this sort of thing by bringing in experts such as yourself in the area of FCPA uh we're, we're able to give our attendees and members a simple message to bring back to their leadership which is easier to sell i i saw a tweet a tweet the other day that said um if you can't explain it simply you don't understand it and and we make that a battle cry of all the speakers that we get, all the people that we get for writing in our magazine and blogging and, and social media, is we try and find the people that know it the best and they're able to explain it in the, in the simplest of terms. And I think that is a big distinction between our conferences and some of the other conferences that you see out there. There are times when people bring in folks based on their name, or the, their, their job title, or their or their uh, company name, as opposed to do these people really understand it uh, well enough? And and frankly, some people are even attracted to the guys who come in and they sound brilliant and they they go on for an hour and and everybody goes, this guy's a genius, and yet and they come out of the room and you say, well, what did they say? And they they, they can't repeat it. Uh, I actually wrote an article about this and posted it on LinkedIn the other day called Corporate Speak, and uh, uh, frankly, uh, it's the most read post I've ever put on that, and the most comments I got is that people are really – pretty tired of uh of all the esoteric uh, hollow yammering of uh of people trying to tell us what compliance is all about and uh i think they're gravitating towards uh education uh that and conferences that take a little more practical approach well and uh just Thinking about uh, Target, I mean, I can identify probably four of the seven uh, elements of a effective compliance program that Target failed in. Uh, certainly training, certainly when people raised their hands and, and initially raised the issue became it, before it became a full on public issue. Uh, the third party uh, was not uh, either instructed in appropriate protocol and probably not audited. Uh, or monitored in any way. Uh, and then after the initial, um, uh, information came, came forward to Target that uh, they had been breached, uh, I think probably, uh, in their steps, uh, certainly in the, in the public sphere, uh, they were highly criticized, but in the, uh, remedial steps they could have taken immediately, they probably, um, also had some some issues there. So when you explain it in, uh, in those terms, I certainly see, uh, See the connection. So, absolutely. Well, you know, uh, Target just so happens to be uh, a company that I am very familiar with. Their their headquarters are here in Minneapolis. I've had a couple of uh, my uh, daughters have done internships there. I've met people that have worked there. I've kind of followed them for years. They have a tremendous uh, management philosophy. They're deeply rooted in the community and give back and and um, a uh, a great way. Uh, but like all companies, um, every once in a while there is something like this happens. And the question isn't whether you have problems or not; it's how you deal with them. And to your point, uh, with regard to several elements of a compliance program that probably should have occurred but didn't, something that went unnoticed by most people, when they sent out the press release that they're going to get a new chief information officer, which is unfortunately part of some of these big deals is somebody is uh, replaced, they also, in the very same paragraph, in the very same press release, mentioned that they were going to get a global uh, compliance officer. Now, why would you mention those two things in the same breath if you didn't make the connection that it really wasn't a technology, well, it, it was a technology failure, but it was also a failure of controls, auditing, monitoring, education, 
policies, you know, and, and various other things. So uh, I'm reading between the lines a little bit. I'm not sure what, you know, that's exactly what they meant to say when they announced the two uh, positions would be maybe looking for the best and the brightest for those two positions in the same breath. But uh, I'm going to give them full credit because I've known these guys for years, and I, I think I think they're doing absolutely the, the right thing. And uh, this is sadly the case in many situations. If you want to go find the best practice, go find somebody that had a pretty big problem a few years ago. And uh, I think Target's going to be held up as one of the best and the brightest uh, after they get uh, all the systems and procedures in place uh, as a result of this unfortunate lesson. Uh Absolutely, and that that is very interesting uh, that uh, those two announcements were made simultaneously. So, I guess we'll just have to follow that and see where uh, where uh, what more uh, additional information will come out. It's a good case study, unfortunately for them, but a lot of people are going to learn a lot of great things from this experience. Uh, Roy, I think probably most uh, folks are aware at the conference there's just a wealth of uh, information provided in sessions. Uh, some some highly technical, some more general, uh, some kind of year year end or, or half year wrap ups of things like the FCPA and where that may be going. But one of the things that uh, I did want to ask you about are the advanced discretion groups, and I think this is an area that uh, the SCCE National Conference really excels in. Uh, but could you describe what these are and how a com compliance practitioner might be able to use them if they attend the conference? You know, it kind of goes back to this comment I said earlier that some people are trying to make compliance programs as this esoteric, complicated, convoluted uh, thing, and it's really not. Um, you know, there's some people out there with uh, uh, descriptions of compliance programs that n numbers in the hundreds and hundreds of pages. The fact of the matter is, is that a well-executed compliance program is really a quite simple. It's just getting the basic things done that people were um, forgetting about or skipping, including some of the things we talked about possibly happening in the target case. Um, interestingly, we get a lot of comments on occasion about people saying they want more advanced subjects. And we have tried to uh, create tracks and we've, we've, we've stood on our head trying to create advanced Topics now there are advanced the the complicated area of of compliance is in the risk areas you know understanding the the laws and figuring out the spirit of the law and the gray areas of law and the intent of the law and and the, these sorts of things that that the risk areas can be complicated but a compliance program is not a complicated concept and the in fact the beauty of the compliance program is really in its uh, simple uh, elegance and. So um, after years of failing to try to come up with a class called the advanced hotlines, you know, I mean, or advanced education, they're, they're just everybody who comes and speaks about education, auditing, monitoring, and investigations, give it their best shot. They give it their most advanced ideas and concepts. After years of listening to the attendees and members, I finally... Dan Roach, in particular, uh, came up with the idea of the advanced discussion groups. But we, we finally came to the conclusion that what they really want to do is take a topic like auditing, monitoring, education, FCPA, or whatever, and not have a didactic lecture, but sit in small groups, and the advanced discussion groups are small groups, and, and, they, and they talk about uh, a particular topic, the person up front has no slides except for maybe a slide or two with questions for the audience, and everybody in the audience has the clickers so they can answer questions anonymously. Um, but but they, there's no didactic lecture. The, the facilitator walks them through some of the more complex questions associated with the particular topic. And then the people in the audience start talking about their particular challenge associated with education or investigations. and. They ask questions of the facilitator who might answer or somebody else in the audience might answer. 
And what they're really wanting, I believe, and what they're getting through the advanced discussion groups is I just want to drill down into the uh, nuances of a particular topic and have specific stories or case studies or examples of how to get around a particular roadblock or deal with a highly sensitive issue and then have the conversation, because it's facilitated, for lack of a better word, climb. You know, one person says one thing, another person adds a little more, another person adds a little more. And after a, a short conversation on a difficult issue, there's this building of ideas that gives the people in the audience the solution they're looking for. And uh, I believe, you know, we have... Uh, at least one track. I, I, I can't remember. We might possibly have two this year. And, uh, you know, as they fill up, we'll continue to add them and, uh, and as they grow in popularity. But it's really a great way for people to talk about the challenging things. If I could just tie it again to an Enron, WorldCom, Tyco, HealthSouth, Penn State University. Everybody knew what... Uh, the rule of law was. They knew that the, the, the rule of law was broken, but for years the problem rotted and got worse because there wasn't an, an, an effective uh, discussion uh, about the nuances of how to deal with it. And, and uh, that's kind of what I hope you know we're getting into in these advanced discussion groups is is uh, I, I sometimes call it the goo in the middle. You got the seven elements. You got all the rules. Everybody kind of knows all that. What is the hard part is the orchestration of all those pieces: uh, neg negotiation, collaboration, influence, uh, compromise, motivation. Uh, th those are the things that people really want to get into, and I think they get to do that with the advanced discussion groups. Uh, one of the other things that uh, you, you certainly advocate um, is that the attendees engage in as much networking as possible. Um, unlike other professional conferences, certainly in the legal profession, where I think networking is really viewed as um, – an opportunity to get your name uh, out for you know p potential advancement. Networking at the SCCE really has a different focus, and from where I sit, the focus is uh, networking to uh, to learn about how others have dealt with problems, find solutions, uh, raise issues. Uh, much more uh, as with the industry, or excuse me, the uh, compliance community itself, much more collaborative. How would you describe uh, some of the networking events at uh, the conference? Well, I'll give you a list of some of them, but Tom, you know, it just it's amazing how clearly you see what we're trying to accomplish there. It really is different. You know, the these people first of all, as you mentioned, are very giving and willing to share and when they see somebody who's new to the pet profession or been around a while and stuck in a rut somehow they want to help them out They're, the first thing that i would say in the networking is there's a great deal of thank goodness i'm here on an island for a few days with people who can relate to what i'm dealing with because there really isn't a, a there really aren't a lot of people back in my office who can i can relate to that's what a professional association is supposed to do is bring together people of similar positions from around the country and help them uh, grow and uh, and so it's it's a very important observation that these people are giving and sharing, and uh, rather than trying to get more business or um, going on some golf thing or boat cruise, they're they're actually using the networking time, you know, to unwind sometimes and talk about something other than compliance, but also they'll get into some of the discussions of things they'd heard throughout the day. But here's here's some stuff that we do to try and increase that because we believe that. Uh, there's two reasons to put on a conference of this kind, and, and one is is education. And there's a lot of great conferences out there that just do a great job of bringing in great speakers and that sort of thing. 
But what, what we think is equally as important, 50% of the reason to be there is the networking. So we set up on Sunday morning um, speed networking where peers can meet six or seven of their peers in about you know 20-minute conversations each, kind of like the speed dating thing, only people fill out a form and and talk about what kind of things they're interested in and, and, and what kind of industry they're in. And and so people are matched up based on their interest. And then there's also speed mentoring, which, uh, frankly, mentoring programs fail a lot because people are just randomly stuck together and somebody may have said they want to be a mentor but really don't come through or somebody uh they don't hit it off they personally don't click and uh what we do is we you meet uh, six or seven potential mentors 20 minutes each and if a couple of them click you stay in touch and again you're matched up based on your industry and interests and other things uh we also have a a thing on Saturday before the conference even starts where people go out and do a volunteer project like Habitat for Humanity or something to that effect. Uh, those people work together for a half a day helping others and the, the bond they connect they create is fantastic with each other. We have long breaks, long lunches. We don't have speakers at lunch typically. Um, we have two receptions, uh, it, so we try and create as much po time as possible for people to get together to have those really uh, good discussions that either helps them out uh, with their perspective on things or helps them out with technical issues. So. It's very important to us to make sure that there is a lot of time for people to connect. Uh, you know, I've talked to, to you about this before, uh, and frankly, I now use it as an example uh, to almost uh, anyone who has a product or a service in the uh, compliance space, which is about the, the philosophy of the SECE National Conference regarding vendors and how that uh, I mean, you really, I think, are or one of the ones in the forefront, or at least SEC, in, in bringing in vendors as part of the solution, as part of the discussion, as part of the networking, as part of the effort to move the ball forward. And uh, uh, what uh, can you tell us sort of how large the vendor group might be and, and where they will be in relation to the rest of the conference? And will we have the, the type of events uh, such as uh, breaks or the – the Jersey night or other social events in an area where we can get to, to meet some of the vendors in this space. Yeah, I, we've uh, we've always been quite amazed at how some vendors get treated at these conferences. It's like the back of the bus and second class citizens, and and um, they charge in some cases an obscene amount of money. Uh, we don't really focus on the money that we get from the vendors. We want to focus on the money that we get from membership and conferences so we'll always be focused on our main mission as opposed to some you know conflict of interest if you will um the 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 vendors uh as you mentioned are very important to us first of all they bring uh, audit legal risk uh regulatory expertise of all kinds to the table uh, professions that sit around with just the exact same kind of people, if it was just limited to, to compliance officers, we'd start drinking Kool-Aid and, and, and not, not learning. You know, we need to sit at the table when we talk about how we're going to do audits. And if there's an auditor at the table and we say something that is completely impractical or inaccurate about the, generally accepted accounting principles or something to that effect, we've got somebody at the table who's going to help us uh, understand it a little better. Same as with risk. And we want all those skill sets uh, uh, there. Uh, you know, the other thing, odd thing that I don't quite understand why putting the vendors in the back of the bus as opposed to treating them like equal partners in membership at least is that they, they tend to hand, hire some of the best and brightest from our profession, and once they move from in-house to the vendor world, 
in a lot of cases they get treated uh, like second class citizens in our case it's uh, it's all still very um uh, equal i think i can't remember but i think we've got about 50 vendors or so my guess is we'll probably end up uh, if we're at 50 we'll probably end up at 55 with a couple months to go uh the vendor area is growing uh, pretty rapidly every year and i think it will continue to grow uh because i think the vendors see uh, the opportunity of, of uh, hanging out with the compliance profession is a, a real advantage. Roy, right, we're uh, at the end of our time here, uh, but I wanted to ask if uh, anyone wanted to get more information about the uh, National Conference, uh, where would they go? Um, we have a, a website. Um, you can just search on Compliance Institute, S-E-C-E, Compliance and Ethics Institute might even be better. And uh, uh, there on that website is not only the brochure, but lots of other information uh, that you can find out, uh, including video testimonials and past programs and uh, various uh, things about the numerous uh, events that I talked about, like the speed networking and speed mentoring and and uh, volunteer project. Uh, so it's a lot of opportunities and uh, all that information they can find on that uh, Compliance and Ethics Institute website. Well, Roy, I'd like to thank you very much for taking the time uh, to visit with me. Sorry for our technical glitches, but glad we were able to uh, get this recorded the old-fashioned way. Always oh, fun to talk, Tom. I appreciate uh, you uh, uh, taking the time to let more people know about this stuff. All right. Thanks a lot. Take care, Tom.